Hey guys, Sneaky Snake here, Brothers in Arms, World of Warships. In today's video, this is the next installment into our Community Replay series, and this one features Sinite of the Western Fleet Clan playing with his buddy D-Mags. They're both playing in the Missouri, the Tier 9 American Premium Battleship, and they're playing some domination here on the map Warrior's Path. So, if you'd like to send a replay into the channel, please send it to biaworldofwarships at gmail.com. Please include the replay file, post-game screenshots, a brief description of the battle, and then of course if you'd like Spider or myself to do the commentary on it, you can also request that as well. So, the Missouri here in World of Warships, it's been out for a couple months, and the developers at least initially wanted to make it very difficult to get, so instead of paying actual gold for it, you have to accrue 750,000 free XP. I'm sure this is not news to the majority of you guys that are watching this, but I still need to mention it regardless. So, also I'm sure you're aware, it takes a very long time to be able to accrue a significant amount of free XP, and if you're somebody like myself, I like to spend it on upgrading vanilla ships when I just buy them. For instance, with the Fletcher and the Baltimore, I didn't even take the ships out until I was able to get the majority of the upgrades for them. Now, what are the actual statistical differences between this and the Iowa, the non-premium Tier 9 American Battleship? Well, the Missouri is an Iowa class, so obviously from a... Um, you know, a looks standpoint, it looks very, very similar. Uh, there's two major differences, however. The first of which is that uh, the ship has better frontal armor. In front of the A turret, where there's the American flag and the 6-3 indicating BB-63, it's about 350-360 millimeters. So you have a better athwart ship citadel thickness, so it allows you to bow tank a little bit better. The Iowa certainly is a, is a pretty good ship for bow tanking regardless, but it is rather weak. Uh, if you go on angles, I'd say 20, 25 degrees or more, that's when you can start to punch through that bow. Whereas in the Missouri, you're going to be able to hold up to battleship caliber shells firing at the front part a lot better than the Iowa. And of course, what should also be mentioned is the second main difference. You get rid of the catapult fighter and the, uh, or potentially the scout plane for the ability to equip radar. It has a 9.5 kilometer range and lasts for 35 seconds, much like the Baltimore at Tier 9, the American heavy cruiser. So it allows you to more comfortably go into cap circles. And while it's not, I'd say, as effective as Hydro at close range, because obviously it doesn't detect torpedoes, it only detects ships, it's still very useful to be able to get spots on enemy destroyers and at least give you better situational awareness when you're pushing in. And you're certainly going to see quite a few examples of that in this game. So here at the beginning, his team is making a push for B and C as two of his shells ricochet off the North Carolina's bow. You can see all three of his destroyers on the team that are at least on this side of the map Inside B, inside C, doing their thing. He has one other friendly destroyer all the way out of A, trying to potentially get torpedoes into the cap and at the enemy battleship that's over there at D3. And at the beginning, he decided to move over here to this side of the map. You can see, however, he's put himself in a position where when he's shooting at the NorCal, none of the enemy ships actually have line of sight on him. So as soon as he shoots, his detection blooms and then immediately goes back to normal. And look at that. 21,000 points of damage done with the Citadel. I don't think that North Carolina was expecting it because, again, he was not detected when he shot. So that's something that you definitely need to take advantage of in any battleship. If you can get behind cover and be able to get very cheeky damage over islands and whatnot, like he's going to right here against the Amato, the more the better. And there we go, another broadside out. Now, another thing uh, that I should mention about these Iowa-class battleships in-game is that they are incredibly accurate if you run the equipment piece, which gives you an 11% buff to your accuracy and it makes these things the most accurate battleships in the game at mid-range now what that means in actuality is ranges of i'd say 12 to 17 kilometers that certainly constitutes medium range here at the high tiers and the shell grippings that uh, these ships are able to get is very 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 good so uh, if you're running an iowa or a missouri that's something i highly suggest to run definitely get the accuracy module it will help out and it's only available to the american battleships at the high tiers so you might as well take advantage of it now unfortunately his team loses three ships in quick succession right there north carolina a tashkent i didn't get to see what the other one was but two of his destroyers and his battleship had all been obliterated right there so all of a sudden the enemy team has a 222 to 433 lead so it's not looking good here at the beginning, even though they do have two of the three caps. You can also see that the enemy team is pushing into Alpha, and the gearing manages to detonate the enemy Iowa. So a pretty ridiculous blitzkrieg of action right there in the last minute. And I gotta say, this was a very interesting start. Besides the nice salvo that he had on the North Carolina, that was one hell of a beating that both sides took. And then, of course, the friendly Shimakaze over at Alpha after detonating the Iowa gets killed by the Yagumo. So he's already lost... Uh, one-third of his team 
And now he's getting ready to, I guess, make a defense here at Objective Bravo. Now, one little thing about this map, map strategy-wise, is it's generally more advisable to go with the A, B strat instead of the B, C. And the reason why I feel this way is because Alpha is a lot more difficult to be able to get into because you see how at Objective Charlie there's really only two large islands uh, in E7 and 8 and F7 and 8, and there's really only one major channel that leads to there. Yes, you can flank around the two islands, but there's only three sides to be able to enter the cap over there. Whereas if you're trying to get over to Objective Alpha, you see that there's many, many different alleyways and avenues of approach to get into the cap. So while it makes it a lot easier to be able to move in there undetected, it also makes it more difficult when you're trying to make a push, uh, simply because if the enemy team has enough ships over there, they're able to counter uh, a lot more of the potential alleyways into there. And then also, if you get trapped over there and you get radared or hydroed, it's much more difficult to be able to break contact because there's all those islands that could potentially get in the way of your ship. And that's really the big thing. So again, they do have B and C, but making a push over into Alpha at this point in the game would probably not be in their best interest. But it appears that uh, these teams TWF guys really don't care, and uh, D-Mags is kind of pissed off right now with his team, which is something that, uh, well, I think I can, I can vouch for him. It's something that happens all the time. So it's 358 to 472. He hasn't done any damage since that very nice salvo on the North Cal, uh, but he's getting ready to push in here, and he does get detected. He hasn't used his radar yet, but the fact that he is detected is a very good thing. The, the, the concealment range that you can get with a full concealment build on the Missouri is 12.2 kilometers. Like I said, the uh, radar range is 12, uh, no, excuse me, 9.5. So you have uh, a decent bit of dead zone, dead space in between your radar and your detection. So he's holding his radar off patiently right here, and I like this play. There's no point to immediately pop it when you do get detected. Yes, those islands provide very good opportunities for enemy destroyers to come flying out, but I like the fact that he's not using his radar yet. He's being very patient with it. A Benson does get detected at 12.7 kilometers away, and then there we go. The Yaguma shows up at 9 kilometers coming around the side. I'm not sure why he got detected there. I don't think he was firing his guns, but nonetheless, he gets a full broadside out at that enemy destroyer, and unfortunately only four overpens, but still 5,000 points of damage, so a nice solid chunk right there. And then D-Mags was able to get another shot there as well and do him. So back-to-back -back salvos on the Yugumo, and then taking some peppering fire from the Fletcher, and he is in a world of hurt. And this is where the radar on the Missouri is something that a lot of people people feel is pay to win, but it certainly has his advantages. The Fletcher was able to spot all those torpedoes without too much of a worry, and now he has 26 seconds left of his radar, so he's looking for a shot here on the Yugumo. Unfortunately, it doesn't appear any of these shells are going to hit as the Yugumo turns back to starboard. Yep, a little bit long on some of the shells and a little bit too far to the left. D-Mags is now shooting at the Yaguma. Will he be able to get the kill? Yes, he does. So a very, very good use of the radar right there. He still has eight seconds left, and he's also detecting some of the enemy ships that are sitting behind the island just off his port side bow. You can see that there's an enemy cruiser and an enemy battleship. I believe it's a Neptune and an Iowa, if I'm not mistaken, that was sitting over there. So he got a little bit of situational awareness for those ships, and I assume that he was paying attention to them at this point in time. He gets a full broadside out on the enemy Yamato. Shells are falling in. Yamato is more or less broadside and no citadels, but still a solid chunk. 11,600 damage done. So he's about 40k here with 1204 left in the game. So a decent bit of damage done, but there's still plenty of work left to be done. Now, at this point, the Neptune and the Iowa, those were indeed the ships behind the island, do manage to get detected. He's not within auto detection range, so I'm not 100% sure what is spotting them. The enemy fighter is moving around, but he does get shot down really quickly. So, again, I'm not really sure how all those ships are getting detected. Maybe it's from the gearing, but then again, I'm still not sure why the Neptune is detected either, because that gearing is almost 20 kilometers away from uh, their position. So, a little interesting here, but now he's using this knowledge right here to move undetected and try and creep around the island. D-Max takes a punt at the Neptune, and he chunks him down to about 14,000 hit points, so a very good salvo right there. But he's still biding his time. He doesn't just want to go blindly charging around the corner, and you can see that the Neptune is actually running away. So if he is dropping torpedoes at potentially D-Mags uh, back off his port side, there's no worry, because uh, he's slowed down, and he's just waiting for the right moment to push around the side. But like I said, you can see how it is a lot more tricky to be able to push into Alpha. You can also see that the enemy team some time ago did capture Objective Charlie, so now his team is actually squeezed in here in between uh, Charlie and Alpha with half of his team over here at A and the other half trying to go back and reset the cap at C. But like I said, you can see how it's very tricky here because there's all these islands and there's all these avenues that torpedoes, torpedoes can come start. down and it's just very, very difficult to be able to get A back once it has been captured by the enemy. 
At this point, he's looking for a shot on the Alabama. And now it appears the gearing does manage to torpedo the rune at Charlie. So now their team only has five ships remaining to the enemy's uh, nine at this point. So it's not looking very good whatsoever. His friends in the gearing and the Shimakaze are dropping close range torpedoes, it appears, on the Iowa and uh, the other enemy cruiser that's over there, respectively. I believe it's the, uh, what is it? The Hipper. Yes, indeed, the Hipper. He's now looking for a shot here at the Neptune, who is 9.8 kilometers away. The Fletcher does manage to take out the Iowa, so at this point, he is now able to safely move forward a little faster. Will he be able to get the kill? There we go. An easy double citadel. Devastating strike on the Neptune. Picks up his first kill of the game with three citadels and 62,000 points of damage done. And now he is angling himself away from the enemy Alabama. So a very nice play right there. He was very patient, waited for that Neptune to get caught out of position, and was able to make that British light cruiser pay. And it's not just American heavy cruisers that are able to just pounce on the British high tier light cruisers. It's also the Missouri, because again, the radar is extremely valuable when they're sitting in smoke, and you could just absolutely delete them without any problems whatsoever. He takes 10,000 from the Alabama, but or 11,000, but manages to deal about 10,000 back to him. So, not too bad. The Yamato does kill the friendly Mogami that was over at Charlie. So both the Rune and his friendly Mogami are dead. And at this point, it is a three versus six. And the game is probably uh, not looking very good for most of you watching this. And you might be wondering, well, what's so special about this replay? Well, it's about time that uh, he's going to go total man, road, man mode right here. And Sinait is certainly going to impress. And this is the reason why I decided to chose this replay uh, for this week. He's now looking for some shots here at the enemy Admiral Hipper. The German heavy cruisers at the higher tiers do have that turtleback armor scheme, so while you don't necessarily get outright citadels, you still do a healthy dose of penetration damage right there, both from D-Mags and Sinite, getting a nice double tap right there on that guy and chucking him down uh, about half of whatever he had remaining on his hit points. He's about 18,000, and that Agnavoy is also making a push into Objective Bravo, so it's at this point that it's uh, it's still 3v6, but now the enemy team is capturing Objective Bravo, so even though they're still relatively close on the points, that number is certainly going to swell up here in the next couple of minutes. He's now looking for another shot here on the enemy Admiral Hipper. D-Max is able to land a solid hit of about 10k, and then he's able to finish him off for the other 5,000 for his second ship destroyed in the game and 86,000 points of damage. So it's not at this point that him and D-Max are going to make a push here at the enemy Alabama. Uh, they do have the hit points lead combined, of course, about 70,000 to 44,000. So at this point, that Alabama has to be very careful of not giving up too much of the broadside. However, with the, the buff to the Alabama right before it was released, uh, before the buff, this would be Citadel City. But you can see right here, the shell's flying in, hits right underneath the turret. Still does a very healthy 18,000 points of damage off of five penetrating hits. But he doesn't manage to actually get a Citadel, and neither does D-Max, who only does about 5,000 points of damage. So that buffed armor scheme on the Alabama is certainly coming into play right there. He's also using his heal. Unfortunately, D-Max did get lit on fire by the Alabama secondaries. He's only about 5,000 points of health, and he's trying, I guess, at this point to get a ram off, but it doesn't appear he's going to be able to make it. The Alabama derps and shoots high explosive into superstructure, but it doesn't really matter because now he is dead. So now Snight is going to have to carry here all on his own. It's 480 to 757, and the enemy team is rapidly gaining on the points now, as it's now a 2 versus 5. His secondaries do manage to set the Alabama on fire once, so now he's going to tick away a little bit more. However, that Alabama is backing up, and it's still going to take a couple more salvos here at least to be able to take care of this Tier 8 Premium American Battleship. You can see, however, that his friendly gearing is making a, well, I'll, I'll just be nice and use the word interesting. He's still at full health, and he is well north of Objective Bravo. So, uh, at this point, I really wasn't sure what that guy was doing. The other enemy gearing is only at 2,400 hit points, and it appears that he is on fire and burning, ticking away. So, this friendly gearing really needs to get over here to help out. He doesn't have to help out killing the Alabama, of course, but he really does need to get on the caps. However, he is going to manage to kill the enemy gearing really soon here. There we go. The fire does manage to take care of him. So, that's a very good thing, of course. But, uh, it really did surprise me that he was well out of position this late in the game. However, Sinite is able to take out the Alabama with one of his four turrets. It's now 550 to 763, but again, the enemy team continues to rapidly increase their point total. They have all three caps. There's still the Amato, the Agnavoy, and a Shimakaze that's left. So these radars will certainly come in handy here. And there we go. He pops his next set of radar, and the Agnavoy appears at 7.2 kilometers. And that is the risk that you run when you're trying to get closer and closer and closer to drop your torpedoes at the high tier, especially when you don't respect the radar. Full broadside out. The Salvo looks delicious. And unfortunately, he does not secure a single pen. He gets, what, five overpens for 6,700 damage and a secondary hit. 
and somehow does not take care of the Ognivoy. So now he has to be careful here because he's not going to be reloaded in time by the time he's able to get another shot on this guy as the Ognivoy turns away. And also, unfortunately, his radar is indeed going to run out. So he still has two minutes now left on the cooldown. However, he has moved into Alpha, so he is uh, preventing the enemy from getting uh, three extra points. So now they're only getting six uh, instead of nine, but at this point it really doesn't look good and even though he's had a very nice game so far It unfortunately appears that it's going to end in defeat here So at this point he also has to aggressively push around the side of the island Like I mentioned earlier getting into alpha is very sticky because at these close ranges with all the islands You just can't get out of detection range because it takes so long and you have to worry about the islands And a full broadside out and he manages to kill the Ognivoy picking up his fourth kill of the game and 135,000 points of damage one of the Amato shells you saw right there hit right in between the A in the B turret, but that extra citadel armor up at the front preventing that shell from being able to go through his armor belt. You can also see there the sixth sense, spider sense is tingling, manages to dodge the torpedoes from the enemy Ognivoy, and then, oh my goodness, the Shimakaze is making a huge charge right here, but wait, no he's not, he's actually turning full broadside, another full broadside out from uh, Sinight here, and he manages six overpens. I cannot believe he did not get full penetrations right there. I really cannot believe that. But now the Shimakaze, he actually screwed up right here. He should have kept charging Sunite in his Missourian. He would have been able to get well within range of guaranteed kill radius, I suppose, with his torpedoes. But for some reason, he has a complete rush of crap to the brain. And he decides to smoke up and wait. And Sunite's only got 31 seconds left on his radar. It's 580 to 916, so he has to kill the Shimakaze really quickly to rebalance the point total a little bit more. And it's also at this point that it appears he is speeding up because he's going to go try and ram the enemy Yamato, who also made a complete dirt play. And like I said, beating a dead horse here, making this push into Alpha where there's all these islands which really, you know, uh, compress the engagement ranges to where... You know, you're able to just get massive amounts of damage, and you're able to spot enemy ships really easily. I just don't understand why the Shimakaze made that play. Only one shot from the forward turret manages to secure the Kraken, and now he is indeed at full speed going for the Yamato. He's only got 16,000 hit points left, so we'll see if his front armor is going to be able to tank these Yami shells. He has his second forward turret trying to go for the uh, disable on the gun. Unfortunately, two of the shells go wide, and he's not able to. The armor belt on the front coming in handy. He does get a turret knocked out, but he only takes 4,000 points of damage as he picks up the high caliber with the secondaries. He's still burning only at 7,400 hit points. He's not going to be able to get his heal, so he really, really needs to get close. He shoots into the armored conning tower to get an extra 7,000 points of damage. A very nice play, and then he finishes off the game with a ram to secure the victory. What a play by Sinite. Alrighty guys, taking a look now at the post-battle results, 1,257,000 credits received. One other thing I forgot to mention about the Missouri, this is the penultimate credit maker in World of Warships. 9,048 total XP, 1,812 free XP, so a very solid performance there. Picks up Confederate Kraken, Devastating Strike, and High Caliber, 227,000 points of damage done. Six of the 12 enemy ships sent pack into the bottom of the sea, three citadels, and he even managed 62 target hits with his secondaries. Taking a look at the team score, 3,000 and 16 base XP. Any game over 3K is a monster game in my opinion. And tonight, thank you very much for sending this replay in. And also I'd like to mention that uh, hey, DMAGs, if you watch this replay, I'm sure you will. Tonight wanted me to tell you that you're indeed a scrub. <laughs> Alrighty guys, uh, just joking, just joking. But anyway, thank you very much for sending in this replay. I really enjoyed watching it. And I hope you guys leave a like, leave a comment, maybe subscribe to the channel. All of it is very much appreciated. We're approaching 1,000 subs, so we got something special lined up for you guys in that regard. So please continue to watch our wonderful content. And thank you very much for sending in these replays. Sneaky Snake here for Brothers in Arms, World of Worship signing off. Guys and gals, have a fantastic day.